Hey guys, Jeremy here with Simple Little Life and welcome to another edition of Tool Time Tuesday. This week we're going to take a look at a metal lathe. Just kind of give you some general information. I'll kind of show you what I use mine for and explain a few of the various parts of a metal lathe. Before we get to that, let's take a look at three viewers' knives. All right, this first knife we'll look at is from Dennis, and Dennis is from the Netherlands. He made this knife. This is his first knife, and when he had originally cut the profile out, he made the handle way too small, so what he ended up doing was actually putting uh, like a plexiglass liner in there, and he said it was quite challenging, but why not uh, challenge yourself in your first knife? So very nicely done, Dennis. Great looking first knife, and thank you for sending these pictures in. All right, these next knives are sent to us by a gentleman named Dave, and he's been making knives for about a year and a half. He also has a YouTube channel where he has some knife making videos. I will warn you though, he's got some really rockin' music, and uh, some of it does have some foul language, so keep that in mind if you decide to check out his channel. These knives are great. I'll leave a link to his channel below, and thanks for sending these in, Dave. All right, and this last knife we'll take a look at was sent to us by a 16 year old knife maker from England, Joe, and uh, this was his first knife he's made. He since started a YouTube channel. I'll put a link to his channel in the description below uh, where he makes knives. Uh, he says that he's learned a lot from this channel. It's inspired him to make it, so thank you so much. And he says one of the biggest challenges is finding materials in England, so he kind of works with what he has, but what fantastic looking knives. Very well done, Joe. Thank you for sending this in. All right, guys, thank you for sending your knives in. If you'd like to have your knife featured on this channel, just email me, jeremy at homesteadknives.com, but I will let you know I've got over 300 viewer knife emails in my inbox right now, so I'm gonna start doing longer dedicated viewer knife videos so you can get caught up on these. Uh, if you email me and you haven't seen it yet, I will get to it. It's just a matter that I, I feature it in the order that I receive it. So I'll get to your knife that you've emailed me. Thank you for sending it in and keep them coming, guys. It's so, so cool to see what you're doing. All right, let's take a look at this metal lathe. Okay, so my lathe is not a really good lathe. It's a very low-end lathe. It's a King Industrial. Uh, it's sized as a 10 by 22, which in theory you could fit a 10 inch diameter piece of stock by 22 inches long. Um, one horsepower, 120 volt, and it does a 12 amp draw. It's got a speed range of 150 to 2400 RPM. Uh, the speeds are adjusted via belt and pulley, and that's under this cover. We'll take a look at that in a moment. And then the motor is actually just mounted right in behind here. Now, let's talk about just the general parts of a lathe. This entire thing is called the headstock, makes sense. We've got our chuck, we've got our bed, which is the main frame that extends past the headstock, and then on top of that, we've got the ways. Now, the ways are a very critical part. Um, they're kind of the peaks like this, and your carriage rides on those. This entire assembly is called your carriage, and uh, this is what adjusts your tools, and, uh, your tool posts and stuff like that. Up top, we've got a compound tool, we've got a compound rest, and so we can adjust, you know, we can slide our tooling in two axes on here and then we've got the actual tool post itself. Um, this here is a lead screw, so this is the screw that will engage the power feed when I'm cutting threads. Uh, this does have the potential to cut threads and you can do metric and imperial, but you do have to change out a little gear set at the bottom depending on the type of threads that you're cutting. Uh, and then back here we've got the tailstock, and in the tailstock right now I've just got a Jacobs chuck so I can drill holes, and then you can also put in things like a uh, live center and stuff, and they just use these, most of them will use some type of a taper, this the Morse taper here, and you just kind of slide them in and out, really cool, really handy so now with this one being a real simple belt drive to change to change the belts I just open up this cover and I can adjust my belts accordingly most bigger lathes have a proper transmission they've got levers that you engage different gears and it's actually a much better way having said that for for somebody just learning and stuff a belt drive is kind of nice because if you really jam up a tool in something um, it can just often the belts will just slip and it, it's kind of a nice safety feature I've worked on some big big lathes I did my apprenticeship on a really large lathe I think it was an eight foot capacity or 12 foot capacity. But anyways, that thing, if you made a mistake and accidentally rammed the tool into something, the things were just breaking. Like there's no give, there's no slip. So uh, these are kind of nice and uh, I see why they don't make these. First of all, the price to make these like actual gear driven, but also these are typically reserved for somebody who does not have a lot of experience. If I was a full-time machinist, this would not be a machine that I would use. Now with these hobby type lathes, the biggest drawback is that they're too light. Uh, same thing with small milling machines and stuff. You know, a lot of them are, can be fairly precise and they're built fairly well and they're, you know, within a thousandth of an inch you can be quite repeatable. But the one issue that they have is that they're just, they're so lightweight. And if you go back, you know, so you look at the old lathes in the 60s and stuff, the lathes that I did my apprenticeship at, at school were about the same size, but they had a lot of mass to them. They had a lot of girth. And that just made really, really nice surface finishes. You could do heavier cuts. Um, you know, this, this entire tool rest area here, this, 
this this carriage assembly is so small and lightweight that you're really limited to how hard you can cut. Having said that, if you just kind of back it up a little bit, do smaller cuts, slower feeds, it does work well and it, and it gets the job done. You can get a decent surface finish and I can get fairly accurate results with this too. Now the thing I use this for mostly isn't like making automotive parts or you know axles for Jeeps or something like that. This thing would have a hard time with a lot of that stuff. I use this a lot for a different pin material. Here's an example. Uh, say it's just a piece of copper rod. You know, you can just accurately borrow the center of it and make like a nice tube for a, pin, for a knife handle or something like that. Um, I do quite a bit of wood with this and I don't make a lot of knife parts but rather a lot of knife jigs and fixtures with this lathe. This is so handy when you're building stuff for yourself, when you're building different jigs and, and all kinds of stuff. You even think about this, like I made my uh, wheels for my very first belt grinder on this lathe. Actually, that's why I bought it because I ended up getting this lathe and my milling machine for 700 bucks. And I thought, well, if I buy those for $700, I can make my own wheels and that's cheaper than buying uh, a belt grinder. So that's why I originally purchased this was to build a belt grinder. Um, and for a long time, I didn't have it in this shop, brought it back, and I actually use this thing. Mostly, it's really small projects. That's why it's kind of messy right now. It's not like I ever set up and just do like, you know, a lot of machining on it. Usually, it's like, oh man, you know what? I need a little bushing. One thing I'll use this for is, you know, if I'm doing like, a, say I don't have a transfer punch the right size of a hole, I can just take a piece of brass stock or something, you know, turn the outside diameter uh, to whatever hole I'd like to replicate, and then turn the inside diameter to whatever I want, usually a quarter inch for my quarter inch transfer punch, and I can just do that it's a matter of like five ten minutes most things I do on here are like five to ten minute tasks uh, in here right now I've got a little piece of wood doweling and um, this is actually just how I burnish my leather I made this little I just put a couple grooves in there I turn this thing on and I take my leather sheaths and I just run it in there to burnish my leather Let's just talk about a couple of safety features with these lathes. These things are quite dangerous. Uh, obviously, the most dangerous part is the chuck itself because that's a big honking thing that spins. You see these jaws right here? Perfect for catching on to rings or gloves, anything like that. Really need to be nervous around this area. Um, one of the most dangerous things, I see people do it all the time and it drives me nuts, is they'll leave their key in the chuck. Don't, don't do that. That drives me insane. Uh, this one has a guard here and it's actually switched, so it should prevent that. Now, I've got it adjusted a little bit Bit high because I was turning something that was really wide and I had to have my jaws way out here uh, but before this was actually set up so that like right now that switch is closing so this thing will run right now I could turn it on uh, I should drop this back down uh, but this is horrible you know when you're when you're getting into running a lathe and using it make a habit to always always this never leaves your hand while it's in the chuck so it's like this right always stays in your hand and then I've just got a little holder right here so I can always keep it not on here it could fall into the lathe while it's running um, but even a lot of times when I'm doing this and I'm adjusting it like this and then I got to measure something I'll keep this with me in my hand and then tighten it up a lot of guys you see them they'll be like you know and okay yep yeah. it's just too easy to leave it in there and that thing will come you turn this thing on this is coming back at you say goodbye to your teeth your eyeball who knows it's just bad bad news so um, that's a critical area also really you got to keep in mind when you got power feeds and stuff like that not to slack I've worked with a lot of guys that'll sit there and they put their power feed on we're doing machining operations that take like five minutes to pass and they'll just sit there and read magazines hot rod magazines and stuff that is so dangerous you know you need to be vigilant when you're using these things uh, these things, like a lot of equipment, they teach really bad lessons really quick. So, um, one other huge safety feature a lot of people don't think about, and uh, I, I, I can tell you this from experience. So, if you got you know a drill press in your in your tailstock here, or a drill bit, a lot of guys will leave them set up like that. Now, the danger in that is that when I go to remove some stock or something like that, if I'm sliding it, all of a sudden I've just completely like shanked myself with a drill bit. So. I put one of these into my elbow one time, doesn't feel very good. Always, always leave these out. You know, you just walk away uh, like that, it's just potential for danger. And so I always make a habit to uh, take my drill bits out and usually I just put the chuck key in there so I know where it's at. Uh, you know, this, it's not gonna shank you like a drill bit will. Uh, same thing with your live center. I usually don't like to leave a live center in there because it can really hurt you bad. All right, so this is the tool post I have on this one and again, um, these, this is a quick change tool post, so it kind of locks in right here, and then to change it, it's got this little 
detent system. So it'll click one way and then lock the other way. So if I want to go, say if I'm turning the outside diameter, I can do that, you know, do my machining operation. And then I want to part it off. I've got a parting tool in here. I can just hit this and I'm not changing cutters out and stuff like that. This has the same thing to do with like a drill bit in there. You gotta remember these are sharp, sharp objects. And if you don't need to have a whole bunch of them in here, it's best not to, but this I had set up for an operation where I was turning the outside diameter and then I was parting off little bushings. So um, I should take this out and leave no tooling in here. Also, you notice I've got some rust in here. I had my door open and we had like a freak windstorm and rain. And uh, so this thing just got rusty recently. Luckily the ways aren't too bad. I keep those lubed up quite well. And uh, here's a slightly closer look of the ways. Um, but my chuck's all rusted and stuff like that. Uh, and again, with the tool post, this thing slides in and out. Uh, typically what I'll do is I'll lock this off without my lead screw spinning. And I'll, that way the carriage is secured. And I'll do my real precise feeds with this dial here. And then obviously your in and out is right here. You can adjust the angle of this. So if you need to machine tapers on things and you know make different cones, stuff like that all sorts of different things you can do with this, but this is this basic one. And there's so many different styles of tool holders that you can get. Um, a lot of them are kind of proprietary, so it's a certain brand will have certain types. And then the cutters themselves, um, this is a simple cutter right here. It's got an insert so I can change out this um, cutter. All oh, the technology behind cutters is just crazy. It's, it, it's nuts. And then something say for this one, that's actually just a piece of uh, 01 tool steel that I've machined and I've made my own cutter with. Actually, the very first time I heat treated tool steel, 01, was when I was 19 years old doing my apprenticeship. We had to make all of our own lathe tools and we used 01 tool steel. So let's take a look at the chuck real quick. All right, so here's the chuck. Now this is a three jaw dependent chuck. Let's just get this out of the way. Uh, what that means is that all these things will move together. So when I put my key in and I loosen it off, all three jaws of the chuck go out at the same time. Uh, there's basically like a big, huge screw in the back here. These kind of fit into it. And these things are also reversible. So I can take these out, flip them around if I need to cramp, if I need to clamp like the outside diameter or something large, I can do that. Um, another thing too, keep in mind, a lot of times when you're turning on a lathe, one of the most convenient ways to, to hold on to it is to turn the inside of it. So if you've got a piece of pipe or tubing and stuff, uh, a lot of times you can just clamp the inside of it and clamp it like that and it's perfectly acceptable. So it's not like these have to be clamped on the inside or the outside. And again, these being reversible, really handy. Now, another common type of a chuck is a four jaw independent chuck. And I'll, I'll put that up on the bench. And I'll show you that in a minute. But these are typically what are usually just left on the lathe. Uh, most people can use this for, you know, 90 some percent of the whatever the machine they're doing. And I'm pretty sure it's an official statistic. And again, we've got this switched guard. That's particular to this model. I do like it. It acts as a bit of a chip guard. Uh, that's one other thing too, a safety feature we didn't really talk on. A lot of time when you're machining, you'll be doing stuff and you end up getting these big long threads and they'll build up, build up. As you start to get closer to the chuck here, it can be really dangerous because that'll grab one of these and just, it's really like razor wire, just whipping around this thing. I've had some really gnarly incidents. I, I've probably spent, I, I mean, when I first did my apprenticeship, that's all I did was lathe work. And I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours if not thousands working on a very large metal lathe. So I've seen some pretty crazy things happen. Um, this machine terrified me more than any other machine I ever used. I mean, I was always so nervous, nervous in a good way, not, not scared of the machine, but just a very, very healthy respect for what this can do. All right. So we'll just look at the transmission here. And one thing that I hadn't mentioned yet, that's really, this is something you need to know. Uh, this right here is a through bore and not all small lathes have this option. So this spindle here is the spindle that the chuck is mounted on this hole. This bore goes all the way through. What that allows you to do is if you've got really long stocks, if I've got like a five foot shaft that I need to turn a thread on the very end of it, I can leave the rest of that shaft hanging out here and still chuck it up in the chuck. This was a deal breaker when I was looking for my lathe. I had to make sure it had that. So something to consider, I honestly, unless you're gonna be doing only small stuff, like even some of my pin material that I use, I can buy eight foot lengths of it, it's a lot cheaper. And then when I'm just cutting off little sections of it, I can just leave it all hanging out here, works awesome. So something that's worth knowing about lathes, not all of them have that, especially the small ones, all the big ones will usually, um, but that was something that was quite important to me. Let's undo this cover here. Now, I won't be able to open it up all the way just because it's against the wall, but what I want to show you is just this gear train right here. You can really see that too well. So these gears are what determine the speed of your threads. 
or your thread cutting. So this is the spindle bore. This is what our chuck is mounted on. And we've got direct drive to our lead screw. And these are adjustable. These all have circlips and some of them are bolts. You just pop them off. You put new sets on depending on the thread that you're cutting. But this maintains a constant relationship between uh, the location of the chuck head and that lead screw. That's the part that allows these things to be so easy. This is where all the threading is done. That's purely just for cutting threads. And then the rest of it, I've just got V belts. I've got one uh, spline belt, a cog belt or whatever, that, that's our main drive belt. And then I've got all these different shivs and belts that I can adjust the speed of the spindle of the chuck. And then for basic operational controls, we've got reverse, forward, and the start. Now you'll notice the start doesn't work. Uh, also, we've got an emergency stop. Uh, the start won't work until this is lowered. So I can hit the start button. No. There. So there's a main switch relay in there. And now I can hit forward. Reverse. And then a lot of them, actually some of the older ones would have a brake, like a foot brake. A uh, big reason for that is if you've got a really large piece of material turning, you're done your cut, you disengage the motor, you shut it off. The inertia is just going to keep it going there for sometimes 30 seconds or longer. And if you had to wait for that to slow down, it'd take forever. So a lot of them just have a real quick brake. You can just step on it, just instantly stop it. And typically that brake will be tied to the stop switch. So as an emergency stop, you know, if something's going wrong, you can just stomp on that thing and it shuts everything down. Don't have that on this. I, I wish I did. I think it's a really important safety feature at the same time. Um, not overly necessary, I suppose. As I mentioned earlier, this is a four jaw independent chuck. This is a bigger chuck than the three jaw I have on there. And see there's four jaws and on the three jaw, you may have noticed that the little uh, slot for the wrench or whatever was in between the jaws. These four jaws, they're right in line and it's basically just a big worm screw. And so I just stick this in here. I don't know if I can really do this. Here. And uh, give this a twist and you'll notice it's just that one jaw that I'm adjusting. And so obviously if you've got some really odd shaped things, you can, you can put a, a square block in there and machine it, a rectangular, even really weird shapes. I have used this a few times to, to machine some really crazy stuff, um, but that's what these do. And then they're fairly, fairly simple to swap out chucks on your lathe. Um, they're threaded and then they've got keepers as well, little clamps. Oh, that's dirty. I didn't clean that out very well, did I? Um, but anyways, they've got little keepers, at least on my model, and you just kind of stick them on there and tighten these up. So that is a four jaw chuck. Four jaw independent chuck. All right, guys, well, hope you enjoyed this video. Hopefully, it gave you a little, a couple things to think about if you're maybe considering getting a lathe. Is this a necessity in a shop? Absolutely not, um, but it is super, super handy. Now, if you were to ask me what I would rather have, my lathe or my milling machine, I would just say you need to roll the dice because I can not make that decision. I just, I don't know. Um, I don't use either of those in the actual knife making process, but I use them both to help make things to help make knives. That makes sense. Anyways, it's super handy machines. I love them. And uh, you know what? Keep an eye open. Look for some used ones. Sometimes there's some hot deals there. Uh, be safe. Like, really respect them. If you've never had experience with these, just really, really watch yourself. But these things open up a lot of doors. You know, even if you're making hinges or something, you want to make your own pins or, you know, a long bolt and, and you don't want to have to custom order it, you can just buy the steel and make it yourself. So, as, as somebody who's like a builder and a tinker and always kind of doing stuff, this thing just gives you so many options and it allows you to take so much more control and do things yourself. So, anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video, guys. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. Channel. Thanks for watching. Cheers.